In physics, a collision is an interaction among a set of objects where the interaction force is the one that dominates the motion of the individual objects. Now that's kind of a weird definition. So let me illustrate this and talk about what I mean. Let's suppose that I'm outside playing basketball. So here I am, I'm gonna shoot a basket. So I shoot the basketball and it's gonna take this arcing path towards the basket. One of my kids is also outside and they take a basketball and as I shoot, they throw theirs so that it intercepts my shot. And these two basketballs collide in midair. So there's the first one and there's the second one like this. So that instead of going this way towards the basket, they're going to bounce off of each other and this one will go like that and this one will go that way. I want to think about this interaction between these two basketballs two ways. I want us first to think about the forces that act on the individual basketballs. And then I want us to think about these two basketballs as a system, as a thing. Let's first think about the individual basketballs. When they collide, this basketball that my kid threw exerts a force on the one that I threw. And it's probably going to be a pretty big force because it made a big deviation in how the basketball was moving. The basketball was going this way, and suddenly it got turned and went over here. So there was a big force pushing it this way. The other basketball, by Newton's third law, had the same magnitude force in the opposite direction acting on it. My son's basketball put a force on my basketball. Newton's third law says my basketball is going to put a force back on the other one. Same magnitude, opposite direction. So my son's basketball would have kept going this way, but it got a big push this way, and so it went flying off like this. So individually, each of these basketballs had a large force on them that was changing the way they were moving. That's what I meant by saying the interaction force dominates the motion. This force is big enough that it's the one that's dominating how this basketball is moving. I'm saying that because there's another force that's acting on the basketball at the same time. There's a weight force going straight down. Same thing on this one. But compared to this force that's making these basketballs bounce off of each other, the weight force is really tiny. So when we talk about collisions, we're talking about a situation where this force is so large that we can ignore the others. This force in orange is the one that's going to determine how this basketball moves during the time that they're colliding. Before and after they collide, I would have to account for the weight force, for gravity. But during the short time that they're colliding, that orange force is going to be the one that determines how that basketball moves. And the same thing over here. That's what we mean by a collision. That collision force dominates the motion and it lets me ignore the other ones. Now that's important because if we take the other view of this, suppose we look now not at the two basketballs individually, but suppose we consider them as a system. And I look at the system of these two basketballs. Well then, if I add these forces together, if I look at the sum of the forces acting on these two basketballs, they're going to sum to zero because Newton's third law tells me that this force is in the same magnitude with the opposite direction of this one. So if I add them, I'll get zero. And that's important because if you add forces together and you get zero, it means the momentum of that thing is conserved. So for the system of these two basketballs, in general, for a system of colliding objects, the sum of the forces equals zero, so the momentum is conserved. The initial momentum equals the final momentum. And this means the momentum immediately before these forces showed up, immediately before they collided. If I added up all the momentums, it would equal the momentums immediately after the collision. So they collide and they go their separate ways. Immediately afterwards, the momentum is the same thing as it was before.
a couple of things about this momentum conservation. Let's notice first that it's a vector equation. In order for the initial momentum to equal the final momentum, each of the components also must be conserved. So really this equation in two dimensions, you could separate into two equations. You could say that the initial x component of momentum equals the final x component of momentum. And at the same time, the initial y component of momentum equals the final y component of momentum. Those two have to be true at the same time in a two-dimensional collision. If you were in three dimensions, you would have three of them. Often in this class, we'll be in one dimension, so you'll only have one. Another thing to notice about this equation is to think carefully about what it applies to. It applies to the system of colliding objects, and it only applies immediately before to immediately after the collision. This basketball's momentum is not conserved. This basketball's momentum is not conserved, but the two of them together have their combined momentum conserved during the collision. If I wanted to consider this motion, I would have to include the effect of gravity, and momentum would not be conserved. This motion would include gravity, and momentum would not be conserved. It's only while this big collision force F is dominating the motion that I can make this approximation and say that momentum is conserved. So it only applies to the system of colliding objects, and it only applies while they're colliding, while that large collision force is dominating their motion. In a physics problem, if you see the word collision, what you're meant to assume is that momentum is going to be conserved. Regardless of anything else, if somebody tells you there's a collision, what they mean is that the momentum of that system is going to be conserved. That's really what's meant by collision, conservation of momentum. Now, as it turns out, there are two kinds of collisions that we'll talk about. There's a kind of collision called inelastic, and there's a kind of collision called elastic. For each of them, momentum is conserved. Momentum is always conserved in a collision. So PI equals PF for this and for this. The difference is that for an elastic collision, for this case over here, we also conserve mechanical energy. Now potential energy is more or less conserved automatically in a collision. Potential energy varies with the position of an object. And our collisions tend to occur at one place. They don't last for very long, and so objects don't move very far. They tend to occur in one place, so potential energy is really conserved almost automatically. But kinetic energy is a different matter. It's not always conserved in a collision. For an elastic collision over here, kinetic energy is conserved. However much kinetic energy came into the collision, that's how much kinetic energy is going to come out of it. This collision up here is probably pretty close to an elastic collision. Each basketball was carrying kinetic energy the instant before they collided. After, if we added all the kinetic energies up, it would probably be about the same. That's a decent example of an elastic collision. Another example of an approximately elastic collision is balls on a pool table. When they collide, nothing gets bent or broken or damaged. The balls come into the collision. They bounce out of the collision. They're moving about as fast as they were. You're conserving kinetic energy also. Now, because in this kind of collision, you have to conserve these two things simultaneously, this vector quantity and this scalar quantity, these problems tend to be a little more complicated and more difficult than the other kind. So what I'm going to do here in this talk is focus mainly on inelastic collisions. And the elastic ones we'll talk about later. We'll handle those in a separate talk after we do some examples and get familiar with the inelastic case. So let's turn our attention now to the other kind, these inelastic collisions. 
This is a collision where, as with all collisions, we conserve momentum, but we don't conserve kinetic energy. Let me show you an example of an inelastic collision just to illustrate what I'm talking about. Suppose we had two blocks that were sliding. This one's going this way, and here comes another one. It's sliding this way. And suppose we arranged it in such a way that when these two blocks collided, they stuck together, and they ended up not moving at all. So they collided, and imagine now they just stopped right in the middle where they collided. So this guy is going to be right here, and this guy is going to be right here, and they stopped. Now, let's think about momentum, and let's think about kinetic energy in this collision. Momentum is going to be conserved. This block on the left was carrying momentum this way, and this block on the right was carrying momentum this way. Momentum is a vector quantity, so those two vectors, let me draw them in orange, this one might have had momentum that looked like this, I'll call it P1, and this one might have momentum that looked like this, P2. When I add them together, they can cancel, and apparently they're going to equal zero, because in the end, nothing's moving and there's no momentum. So this vector added to this vector would equal zero. So we can certainly conserve momentum in this case. But kinetic energy is a different matter. This object before the collision had kinetic energy. It's half mv squared. It's a positive scalar. This object had kinetic energy, half mv squared, also a positive scalar. So before the collision, there was kinetic energy in this system. It was a positive number. After the collision, these two guys are both at rest, and there's no kinetic energy anymore. So we lost kinetic energy. Mechanical energy was lost in this collision. That's a kind of collision that we call inelastic. Anytime you lose mechanical energy and you only conserve momentum, it's an inelastic collision. These are collisions where things get bent or broken or damaged or stick together. Any of those things involve transferring kinetic energy into a different kind of energy that's not what we call mechanical energy. So when you lose mechanical energy, it's inelastic and you only conserve momentum. You might wonder where the energy goes. It goes several places. When these two objects collide, there's probably a bit of sound as they crash into each other. The sound can carry some energy away. When they collide, there is some work being done as they're sticking together and maybe they're deforming each other. Imagine taking an object and deforming it many times. You can feel it getting hotter. Its temperature goes up if you take something and squish it and deform it many, many times. Some of the kinetic energy goes into doing that. When objects combine and lock onto each other, they deform a little bit, and that takes some of the kinetic energy away. So through this and other ways, kinetic energy is taken out of the system and transformed into other forms of energy. But the thing to remember is that for an inelastic collision, all you do is conserve momentum. You look at the momentum before the collision, you account for it all, mass times velocities, and you set it equal to all the momentums after the collision, mass times velocities. We'll do this in a number of examples to get some practice. Before we move into examples, though, let me define one more term for you. There's a term you'll come across when you're dealing with inelastic collisions, and it's called perfectly inelastic. So I'll put it over here, perfectly inelastic. That means that two objects collide and they stick together. This just means that they stick together. So that after the collision, the two objects travel as one. That's what's meant by perfectly inelastic. They collide and stick together. We talked about a perfectly inelastic collision in the last talk. Remember we had this big block with mass capital M, and we had this wad of putty, mass little m, that somebody was going to throw at it with velocity little v, 
and they stuck together so that the two of them drifted off. And after this collision, we had this thing going this way at some final velocity we call capital V, but this wad of putty was stuck to it, and they're both moving together at that common final velocity. That's what's meant by a perfectly inelastic collision. So there's a good example of it right there. All right, we'll move into some examples now. The thing that I want to leave you with, the last thing to remind you of, is that when you see the word collision, this is what is meant by it. You are meant to think that the collision force dominates the motion, and because of Newton's third law, you can be sure that for a colliding system, all of those will add to zero so that momentum is conserved. The inelastic collision problems we're about to look at are exercises in momentum conservation. So we'll look at those problems next, and then we'll come back and talk about these more complicated elastic collisions.